Good evening all and welcome. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's signed up on Patreon to the $10 tier, who's going to receive a bunch of stickers in the mail, a letter from me, and of course all the exclusive content you get on Patreon itself. I've received an overwhelming number of messages and emails about people who say they want to sign up but can't yet, so I'm extending the deadline two more weeks. Um, so I hope that those of you who are still interested can sign up. Also good news, I've actually decided to print um, not just like paper stickers but vinyl stickers too so they stick on stuff for longer and look cooler as well as paper stickers that I'll send in the post too. So even more stickers. I think I'm going to wrap things up now so we can start. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I'm a 39-year-old female, and my story took place when I was 15, but it feels like it was yesterday. It was the day that would change my innocent youth forever. I am from a little village in Ireland with a population of a few hundred. The nearest town is about 10 miles away. Growing up in rural Ireland was very idealistic. Summers were spent playing football with neighbours or going to the lake swimming till the sun went down. I was lucky enough that even though the population was small and the houses far apart, my best friend's house was only down the road. So during those summer months, Mary and I were inseparable. My friends and I grew up with lots of brothers and sisters in a safe village, and we were given a lot of freedom, and sometimes we were gone all day and only came back before dark. As it was the mid-90s, we had no mobiles, but our mums knew we would be okay and look out for each other. One thing we liked to do during these summers, besides going to the lake and hanging out at each other's houses, was to go downtown and look around the shops. The easiest way to go down was to get a hitchhike as there was no buses. Here in Ireland, we call it thumbing. Hardly anyone hitches now because most households have two cars and parents are a lot more protective. But back in the 80s and 90s, it was common. Our parents were okay with it, but there were certain rules we had to follow. I'm not entirely sure who came up with the rules, but I assume our parents did. Rule 1. Never hitch alone. You must thumb with at least one or two friends. Rule 2. Never take a lift if there are two or more men in the car, but two or more women is fine. Rule 3. Never take a lift from someone in a van. There could be more guys hiding in the back or worse, ropes and blindfolds. 4. This is the most important rule. When a car stops to pick you up, always ask the driver where they are going first. If you tell them where you are going first, they could pretend to be going to the same place to lure you in. We were innocent but had common sense, so we followed the rules down to a T. At least, we tried to. My friend Mary and I used to hitch once a week during the summer, so we could go to town with a population of a few thousand and look at the shops, eat ice cream and hang out. When we got a ride, we had to make small talk with the driver, and as two shy 15-year-olds, this bit sucked the most. To make it far worse, we took turns sitting in the front, and one did most of the talking. One day, we spent a few hours in town. It was pretty uneventful, so we decided to thumb back. At around 3pm, we usually went to the spot where we'd hitched from, just on the outskirts of the town. We were only waiting about five minutes when a white car pulled up. Before we could ask where he was going, he asked us first. My friend told him, and he said he was just passing through our village on the way to another. Rule 4. Broken. But he seemed nice enough, and we just wanted to go home. It was my turn to sit in the front. The driver introduced himself as John, a farmer, and was super friendly. He was dressed in a worn t-shirt with holes in it, had tattered pants and smelled of cow poo, the cow was full of bits of straw, and old and battered like the driver. He was about 60, had no wedding ring on, and don't ask me why, but I noticed these things. About halfway between town and our home village, he asked if we heard a noise. No, we reply. There it is again. Sounds like a banging noise. He said that, but we didn't really hear anything and just sat there quietly. Might be the exhaust. I'll have to pull in and have a look. He pulled up on a busy road and went to take a look. I didn't hear anything, said Mary. He seems like a weirdo, I replied. Call it intuition, but even though he was super friendly and chatty, I got a bad feeling from him. Next thing he does is come back to the driver's side and tells us that his exhaust is hanging down and was hitting off the road, and he needs help to tie it up. 
It was then I noticed he had string holding up his pants instead of a belt, and thought this was odd. He got some string off the boot, same colour string as his belt, and we both went to get out the car. Although I got a bad vibe from him, I didn't feel scared at this stage. We were on a busy road and it was around 3.30, so we both got out of the car. He showed us the exhaust pipe hanging down and used a rag to hold it up because it was hot. My friend Mary took over holding it while he secured it with string. They were both kneeling while I just stood there and watched. It was then I noticed his flies were open and I could see his genitals. He was clearly not wearing any underwear. He didn't even have a belt on, so I figured I wasn't surprised. In my head, I thought, what the hell is going on? Oh crap, oh crap, but said nothing. I stood there in shock. Mary hadn't noticed at this stage and just continued to hold the pipe. When John was standing up, he noticed his fly was open and acted shocked. Oh girls, I'm so sorry. I only have a safety pin holding the fly together. Must have come off. Forgive me and get back in the car. Mary was stunned because she got a close-up of his privates, which left me to do the talking. I told him it was okay, that it was an accident. So we go back to the car. He fastened the safety pin even though I didn't see him look for it. All was hidden again. Back in the car, the atmosphere was now very different. We both felt mortified and he kept apologizing over and over. I looked out our passenger window and repeated, it's okay. Then he said something that turned my stomach. Well, girls, you're taking it very well. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear you'd liked it. Then he nudged me in the arm with his arm, like you would a friend. I looked at him through the corner of my eye, still facing the window when I noticed his fly was undone again, and he was exposed again. He must have noticed me looking because he said, Oh, sorry, safety pin keeps opening. Just don't look. Fine by me, I thought. Okay, I reply, and continue to look out the window. He kept nudging me and saying, Don't be looking, don't be looking, and giggling at the same time, like it was a playful joke. Mary began giggling too, because she laughs when she's nervous. I knew it wasn't her fault, but I was getting angry at this stage. He wouldn't stop telling me to stop looking, and then he said, Your friend is laughing, she must be enjoying the view. This made her laugh even harder. Now remember that we're both polite 15 year olds and always respect our elders and are a little shy, so I would never speak up to an adult. The nudging in my arm and my friend's laughter was all getting too much. He asked, is this the first Willie you've ever seen? I was turned facing the passenger window so much that I had my back to him. There's no way I could be looking. I lost my temper and shouted at the top of my voice that I'm not looking into Mary to shut up. Silence followed. He said sorry that he was only joking and I didn't need to be so serious. I said nothing and sat there red with temper. I should have told him to let us out. I should have told him to cover himself up the dirty old perf, but I was in shock too and part of me wanted to believe that it was an innocent mistake. We all know it wasn't. We finally arrived to our tiny little village. We got out and he said again he was sorry about the whole thing and my friend got her voice back and assured him it was okay. I said it was okay and not to worry. I said thanks for the lift, and what he said sickened me. He looked me up and down and with a creepy smile said, girlies, thanks for everything, and drove off. We were left speechless. We sat down on a nearby bench to process all of this before going home. We made a deal not to tell our parents or they'd never let us hitchhike again. My friend got back her voice and repeated, Pervert, sicko, smelly bastard. He had planned it the whole time, over and over. About five minutes after sitting down on a bench, who drives going in the direction we just came from? Only pervert Farmer John, waving and smiling, while we sat there stunned. He had beeped to catch our attention, so much for just passing through our village. A few months later and the ordeal went to the back of my mind. Occasionally we would talk about Farmer John, but we made jokes about it and we told our friends what happened. One day I told a friend of mine named Brid, a cousin of hers, had told her a very similar story. The cousin lived on another village about 20 miles in the other direction of town. She was a few years older than us and while hitchhiking home one day the same thing happened to her and her friend. The exhaust, the safety pin and the undone fly. It was no accident, 
and my worst fears were confirmed. Farmer John was really pervert John. So to the man who smells like cow crap, has worn clothes and used string to hold up his pants, and to the man who gets off exposing himself on young girls, let's not meet again. In 2011, me and my family were at Darien Lake in upstate New York on a roller coaster called the Ride of Steel, like as in Superman. On the tracks, there runs two trains, with eight or so per train. They sit two people across and had lap restraints. I was on train two, which was at the station. While getting in, I looked out at the coaster and thought I saw a falling blob just after the second major drop. I shook it off as I was wearing glasses and my vision is still trash. So we go around the track and stop just before the station. We are waiting and waiting, and my family wonder what's happening. We see the car in front of us is still occupied with the riders, with an empty wheelchair next to one of the cars. Now it was a packed ride with long wait times and every seat was full except one. In the car next to the wheelchair. After waiting about 15 minutes, they finally let everyone off but keep the train in the station. After 15 more minutes, they send the train and we pull into the station. The ride attendants are in shock and don't speak to anyone. Later, we spoke to some of the waiting guests who were in the line to ride the ride of steel. They said a man fell out. I witnessed the death of a guy on a roller coaster and didn't even realize it. The guy who died was an Iraq double veteran amputee who was missing one leg and most of the other. He flew out of the lap bar because he had no legs. And to this day, people do not believe me when I tell the story and my family barely believes me as I was 12 at the time. I was never really afraid of gore or death. But in that moment, there sits a feeling, knowing you witness someone's last moments alive. And that feeling is indescribable. As a 14-year-old boy, I have experienced some scary things, but this has to be the scariest. This happened to me during the summer of 2019. On this day, I was headed to my cousin's house for a party. He told me that he also invited a family friend who he and I were close to, so I was fine with it. It was around 4 p.m. when I left my house. Herbert lives around 40 minutes away from me, so it was a decently long drive. It's good to know that Herbert lives at the end of a cul-de-sac, which is at the end of a street. On his right and left were neighbors, but in front of his house, there was only a forest. I arrived at Herbert's house around five, I said hello to his family and the other people there. I then greeted Herbert and Abel. We decided to go swimming. Herbert has a big swimming pool in his backyard. We swam for about three hours and after we were just chilling in his room playing video games and talking. Our parents told us they were going out and asked if we wanted to go with them. We all said no so they left, meaning the only people that were home were me, Herbert and Abel. About an hour later, I got the bright idea of ding-dong ditching. For those of you unfamiliar, it's when you go up to someone's house, press their doorbell and flee, preferably hiding in some bushes or something to witness the hilarity of them opening the door to be met with no one. Since this story took place during the summer at 9pm, it wasn't all that dark out. We skipped a bunch of streets then started ding-dong ditching houses. Each one gave a funny reaction. The next house we would go to, we all agreed would be our final one. A weird thing that we would do is play rock, paper, scissors to decide who would be doing the actual ding dong ditch to the house. He did the last house, so it was between Abel and I. I ended up losing, so I went to ring the doorbell of the house. I ran the doorbell and ran and hid behind the car that was parked across the street. Abel and Herbert were hiding in the bushes near the car. I would have been hiding behind the bushes as well, but the bushes were further from the house, so I thought it would risk me being seen. I waited a good two minutes for the door to open. A tall man emerged. The man was white, about six foot five with a beard. What happened next surprised me. As soon as the man opened the door, he ran in my direction, yelling, Come here, I won't hurt you. I did what anyone would do. 
I took off running. The man kept repeating the phrase to me. That only caused me to run faster, and I ran so fast and far that I don't even know where the man stopped running, but eventually he did. I had my phone on me, so I took a rest from running so much when I received a call from Herbert. Here's how the conversation went. Yo, dude, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. This is crazy. The guy literally chased me. Meet me back at your house. I ran back to Herbert's house and entered his backyard through the side gate. Then I entered his house through the back door, locking it behind me. The adults weren't home yet. That never happened to me before while doing ding-dong ditching, so I was freaked out a bit, but I calmed down and told Abel and Herbert what the man was saying to me while he chased me. Abel tried to help us forget about it by saying, let's go watch a movie in Herbert's room. While we were walking up the stairs, we heard Herbert's backyard side gate door open and close. Abel asked the parents. I called my mum and they said they were still nowhere near the house yet. My heart sank. I told Abel and Herbert that my parents were starting to freak out as well. I went downstairs and screamed. Herbert and Abel both came and asked what happened and I told them to look at the backyard door. There was a man wearing black, all black, staring at us through the backyard door. I could make it out to be the same man who had been chasing me and in his hand I could see what appeared to be a baseball bat. The man tried the doorknob twisting it until the lock kept on restricting it. He started laughing like a mentally insane person, then said to come out and play and that he wouldn't hurt me. We were all frozen in fear. I have never been so afraid in all my life. I said to the man that I was calling the police. It was a bluff, but it worked. The man vanished from the backyard door and we hear the backyard side gate open and close. We quickly ran upstairs to see the man waving at us and running into the forest, never to be seen again. We promised each other never to tell anyone, and we didn't. And Abel and I stayed the night at Herbert's house because we were planning to go anyway. I still get scared to this day thinking about what happened. The man chased me for God knows how long and then showed up at Herbert's back door. There was nothing stopping the man from baking the glass door and coming into the house. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if he did or if I just forgot to lock the door. This happened about two years ago, and is now a distant memory that I decide not to think about. I'm still chill with Abel and Herbert, but we obviously have not been ding-dong ditching since. When my mum lived in Biloxi, Mississippi, and had just turned six, she was on her way back from school and took a shortcut through a hole in a fence to get to the church for choir practice. As she got to the other side and was making her way down the street while carrying books, a car showed up behind her and began following her. My mum was already used to this kind of thing since it happened to her quite a bit sadly. Noticing something was off and slowly turning her head to peek at the driver, the look at the man's face told her all she needed to know. The guy tried to grab her attention, but when she sped up her pace, he slammed the brakes and tried to jump out of the car to grab her. But she'd already thrown her books to the ground and was running towards the church as fast as she could. He got back into the car and hit the gas to catch up, but she had already made it to the back door of the building, and as it turned out, it was locked and no one would open it either, since they couldn't hear her banging on the door. So she slowly went back up to peek around the corner to see if he was still there, and he was still trying to find her. Here is when she suddenly heard some music coming from the parking lot across the street, where they usually had some old, circus-style looking wagons standing around. They were all splintered, rusty, their colours faded, and they were locked. But when she looked over there, there was a single one that looked brand new with its door open. And inside, there stood a middle-aged man, who looked like he could have been Italian, who called her over with a waving hand and a smile. From afar, he asked if she would like a snow cone as it was such a hot day. And as he said that, he had stepped onto the top stair of the wagon and stared directly at the guy in the car. He literally stared him down. And because he did that, the guy took off. Meanwhile, my mum, albeit cautious, 
had just gotten to the front of the wagon and told the man, I don't have any money. With a smile, he said it was free and began making her a snow cone when her sister came out of the church to look for my mum and asked what she was doing. She too was confused to see this brand new looking wagon out there since there were never any before. He proceeded to ask her if she'd like a snow cone too and then made her one as well. With their snow cones in hand and thanking the man for his kindness, they waved and said goodbye while he stood in the doorway and watched them return to the safety of the church. As they reached the building, one of the church members, who was kind of mean, told them they weren't allowed to bring their snow cones inside, so they had to turn around and go back to eat it quickly, but couldn't finish it fast enough because of brain freeze. But before going in, they looked up to see if the snow cone man could see them throwing the snow cones in the trash, but he was gone. And while the wagon was still there, the colors were now faded. It was splintered full of spider webs and was locked. No more music either, just dead silence. My mum said their mouths had dropped and they ran over there to take a closer look. It really was nothing but an old dusty rusty wagon. After some speculation, her sister said it must have just been an angel, but she just froze and didn't say anything. When she told the church member about the man giving the snow cones to them because the woman had asked where they got them from in the first place, she told the two of them that there was never someone selling anything over there since decades and didn't believe them. My mum just told her that the leftovers were still in the bin. That woman then basically just told them to stop lying and making up stories and went back inside and my mum looked at her sister, shrugged and shook her head. A few years ago, I got into a car crash on the highway, and my car veered off the road into the woods before hitting a few trees. I was hit in the head pretty bad during this, but remember everything from the moment clearly. I was wearing a pair of sunglasses that my mother had bought me the day before, which had obviously fallen off, so my first instinct was to find my glasses so I didn't lose them. I spot them on the floor, and as I try to reach them, a tall man starts knocking on the passenger window, asking if I'm alright. I look over, only seeing the body of the man as he wasn't leaning down and looking inside, and I just said, Yeah, I'm fine. I, I just dropped my glasses. I need to get them. Next thing I know, this man is grabbing me from under my arm and pulling me out through the passenger side door. He stands me up and says, You'll be alright. Just walk out to the road and sit on the railing. Almost automatically, I start doing exactly what the man said without thinking or even turning around to see what he looked like. I get to the railing and tell exactly what happened to everyone that stopped to check on me, including the paramedics and police officers. It wasn't until a few days later when I found out there was no man that helped me. The first people who stopped by to help only saw me either sitting on the rail already or walking to it to sit. They didn't see the man I described, and neither did the police or paramedics. I have a family member who really believes in spirits, and she believes it was my grandfather who helped me. He passed away three months before the accident, and thinks that the reason I blindly listened without thinking or even looking back to the man was because I already knew and trusted the voice. I personally have no idea what to believe, but I just know someone helped me that day. My dad was in the car with his best friend and the friend's daughter driving on the motorway. The daughter is diabetic and during the drive she started to show symptoms that she was running low on sugar, except my dad and his friend had gone without any snacks for her. They start to panic looking for a place to get off the motorway. All the while her symptoms start to get worse. It gets to the point where she begins to have a panic attack. I don't know why they stopped but they did. There, on the hard shoulder of the motorway in the middle of nowhere with a young girl hyperventilating which makes her symptoms worse. And then out of nowhere, a stranger shows up, just an ordinary guy walking along it. He walks right up to the car, hands my dad's friend a chocolate bar and walks away without another word. They gave the girl the chocolate bar and sure enough she begins to feel better. 
but when they looked back down the motorway, neither my dad nor his friend could see where the guy had gone. My dad is religious, his friend is not. And even so, they both agreed that something supernatural had just taken place. I was working at a gas station the graveyard shift. Some guy runs in all tattered up, sweaty and exhausted, and frantically asked me, What is today? I told him the date, and he's like, No, the year. So I told him, and he yells, Oh, crap, and ran out the door. I thought it was a prank or something, so I didn't give it a second thought. Moments later, I opened my phone, and all my contacts were as they were months ago. My wallpaper was back the same, and my icons and my ex back in my phone. Her parents, her siblings, her old friends from school. The only thing that didn't come back were my picture and texts. But all those contacts that I knew I deleted soon after I broke up with her, which was five months before this happened. I don't believe in a lot of supernatural stuff, but I often wonder, what if the guy was a time traveller and he walked too close to me and it somehow affected my phone? Far-fetched, I know, but even so... This happened when I was 14 years old, and I was fishing up in Alaska. My father works for United Airlines, so we'd fly up there on standby for cheap every summer and go fishing for silver salmon. There was a car crash at a river we were fishing at, and a lot of police were around. After a little while, a police officer came over and asked me to please stand up and fish on the other side of the river. It was a bit of an unusual request. I had been sitting on a log covered in a tarp that someone had presumably left while fishing there earlier due to the fact it had been raining that night. Turns out I wasn't sitting on a log. Once they pulled the tarp off, it was actually the driver's body. A very creepy experience. This story from when I was much younger, was at least seven years ago now, is when I rented a room in a house. I had four roommates. Coming home from work, I would always find the stove on, and everyone would deny using the stove. There was a bunch of us, so it's quite likely that one of us just kept forgetting, but we could never figure out who. We joked that it was a haunted house, but we all thought someone was just a little bit drunk or whatever when they left it on, or just forgetful. Anyway, this event keeps happening, much to everyone's annoyance. Well, one night I'm standing in the kitchen with them. We're just having a chat, when suddenly we hear a noise over by the tap. We look over to see water start spewing out at full blast from the kitchen tap. As you can imagine, shock and dread filled our bodies as we rapidly turned the water off and fled the area. Safe to say we figured out that it may have just been paranormal activity that was causing these strange events to happen in our shared home. Safe to say, I moved out very quickly after experiencing it firsthand. I was at a little party last summer, and we realized one of my friends was missing. There were only about 20 of us, so it didn't take a long time for us to realize this. Now keep in mind, the host's house is very big and ancient, near a wood that is known for being the place where people went to drink. We call her phone a few times, and she doesn't pick up. We called her boyfriend at the time, who said she had never contacted him. It had been about 30 minutes since we noticed and went searching the house twice, but is nowhere to be found. It's raining extremely heavy, so we don't think she would have been there, but she was very drunk. Me and my other two buddies ran around the neighborhood for half hour. We couldn't find her. On the road next to the house, I just see a random 40-year-old guy with a beer in his hand walking in the rain drinking. He looks at me and screams at me to watch out for the rain. But I was lucky to still be this young, 
which I thought was funny. Oh, and he also clearly had a gun in his pocket. I was relieved to see he didn't go towards my friend's house. Keep in mind I'm in Canada, so I found this very odd. I go with another girl in the woods and talk to her about earlier, because maybe she thought people were there, even though there was clearly no one there because of the rain. The girl I was with was really panicked too. We walk around the woods calling her name and then I notice something. There were two very tall people in the middle of the park on top of the stairs in what looked like long robes. They were both looking at something on the stairs. My brain automatically thinks it's the girl we're looking for, but these guys looked really creepy so I didn't just want to go to them and tell them it's our friend. My brain automatically thinks it's the girl that we're looking for, but these guys looked really creepy, so I didn't want to just go and tell them it's our friend. We'll just pick her up, thanks, bye. I didn't mention this to my friend. I was surprised the two hadn't heard us before, and after a minute they start walking away. I guide the other girl to where they were without either one of them seeing me. We arrive at the spot. They were not looking at my friend on the floor or anything. There were just three squirrels apparently dead on the stairs. They did not look like they were shot, hit or bitten. I remember that we still have to look for our friend and my other friend is pretty disgusted, so we leave. We call our other friend to see if they find her, but they didn't. It's the most anticlimactic ending ever, but we go back to the house completely drenched in water. My friend goes to get her boyfriend's coat, and she finds the girl we're looking for sleeping in the corner under three other coats. Glad she was safe, but I was close to having the scare of my life in the woods earlier, thanks to these creepy buggers and whatever the hell they did to those poor squirrels. When I was 17, I was at a friend's party. We grew up in a small town, lots of wood, no street lights, houses far apart from one another. There was virtually no crime in this town, except for the abduction of a fifth grader about a decade earlier. Her remains were found behind a restaurant in town years later, but the case sadly was never solved. My friends and I had been drinking all night, so I didn't want to drive home. That happened to me frequently enough, and I always had a sleeping bag in the trunk of my car. Around 2 a.m., I ran out to get the sleeping bag. It was pouring out with thunder and lightning, and I could barely see my car, which was parked just beyond the driveway on the other side of the road. When I got to it, I popped the trunk and dug around for my sleeping bag. There was a flash of lightning and the street lit up for a second. That's when I noticed a middle-aged man standing a few feet from me. He didn't move, he just stood completely still. I can't remember what I said, for all I know I probably gasped. However, I remember exactly what he said. I just love thunder and lightning storms, don't you? Not even a hello or a sorry I didn't mean to startle you. I slammed my trunk shut, sleeping bag still in there and sprinted back to the house. I immediately told everyone what happened and of course they were drunk and thought I was making it up but I forced them to look out the window towards the driveway. After 30 seconds, lightning struck and the street lit up again. Sure enough, there was the man walking down the street in the opposite direction of the house. I don't know about you, but it was intensely creepy. In college, there was a big rock at the top of a hill that everyone used to climb. It had lights pointing to it, so it would be lit up at night. Some friends and I decided to climb to the top at night. It was a nice evening, but there was a chance of rain, so we get to the top and I see lightning in the distance. I count the time between the lightning and the thunder. 15 seconds. I tell my friends, hey, that storm's coming our way, and I guess we have around 15 or 20 minutes before it gets here. It took some convincing for them to agree, and even though I was being a negative Nancy, we would head back down. Getting town took 15 minutes. Just before we got to the cars, lightning hit the rock and blew out all the lights. Everyone made it off the rock. When the lightning struck, one of my friends said, Please don't say I told you so. One night when I was 13, I was doing a weekend visit with my dad. You know, the kid of divorced parents. In the middle of the night, we got a phone call. I knew that a call in the middle of the night was never good. My dad answered it, 
and I heard him whispering and I knew it wasn't good news. It was at this point I noticed that there were red and blue cop lights whirling around from the window. The next thing I know, my dad comes into my room which I shared with my sisters. The weird thing was he was squatting down low. He saw I was awake. Since I was the eldest, my dad told me what was going on. He whispered, I need you to help me wake up your sisters and keep them calm. It was the police. There's a man on the street with a gun and we are being evacuated. At this point, my heart was racing. I remember it was pounding in my ears, it was beating so hard. The cops had told us to leave all of our lights off, stay away from the windows and lay low. So I helped my dad wake my two younger sisters. We played it all as a game, as we stayed near the floor and put on our winter boots and coats as it was freezing out. The next part was the hardest. We kept it vague what was going on with my sisters because we had to go back down two flights of stairs very quietly. When we got outside, I was terrified of being in the open. My mind started imagining how bad it would be if we got hurt, or if I died. What if I had to watch my sister or dad get shot? And yet I couldn't let any of that show, so my sisters wouldn't be as scared as I was. We meet the cops at the bottom of the stairs. They told us to leave the area on foot. My dad asked, where? They shrugged, so we went to a 24-hour burger place a few blocks away. After we evacuated the area, I felt so relieved. We sat in the burger joint drinking cocoa and sleeping on the benches for a few hours with some other evacuees. But nonetheless, having that existential crisis at age 13 really scarred me for the longest time. I don't remember if the guy ended up being caught, but eventually we were allowed to go back home. But still, the fear you feel when someone might be targeting you with a gun and may very well want you dead by the end of the night, definitely leaves an impact. I come from a pretty middle-class family, all wholesome, etc. I have bipolar disorder, and in my teens I smoked weed, drank, took a lot of shrooms, hung out with the guys that stole cars and shoplifted. I used to hitchhike a lot, as we lived pretty rural. My first real girlfriend was a pretty hectic chick from Ukraine who grew up in Russia. Long story short, she suddenly ghosted me, but eventually I found out she was seeing someone else. And obviously I saw Red and had to find out. So I hitched into her town at around midnight. The guy who picked me up was in his 40s or so and asked why I was on the highway hitching. He was worried because he had a daughter around the same age and he asked advice on how to deal with her better and he listened. I felt a huge respect for him. He asked why I was hitching at midnight and I told him. All he told me was to be careful. It could be a big moment in your life. The ride I got home was the big one though. So I get to her house and long story short, cops were called. I sprinted through backyards and through drains and alleys to get to my hitching spot at the start of the highway. As I'm running down the road, I see a car. A miracle, it's 3 a.m. now, and the car actually stopped. I open the door and it's the nicest smelling car. The driver is a lovely 70 year old lady and she says, are you going to rob me? I laughed and said, only if you don't rob me. And I hopped in. We rode in mostly silence, but towards the end she said, you remind me of someone I lost long ago. I know things will get better for you soon. And eventually I got home. I had a little granny flat away from the house, so I snuck and jumped into bed. Literally 20 seconds later, I hear my dad walk from the house to my room on the phone saying, I think you've got the wrong person. He barges in and is like, hey, Danny, are you here? Yeah, why? The police are on the phone looking for you and hands me the phone. Hello, your ex-girlfriend says you smashed her window. I've been here all night. Where's that? And I say a small town around 20 minutes away. Okay, good night. If the car hadn't pulled up, and let's face it, why the hell was an old lady driving around at 3 a.m.? I'd be put away and my life messed up. I cleaned up my act and after high school, I'm doing very well, but my life would have been very different if it wasn't for that old lady giving me the ride that literally saved my life. This happened before I was born. Our house was placed at the back of our land, 
so we had a big front yard and a tall metal fence. One night my dad was outside hanging the clothes and he came running inside and said to my mum that somebody was coming in from the front fence. She scolded him and said that our fence was locked and that there was no way anyone was breaking in and that it was just his imagination. Around this time, one of my dad's friends said she has been seeing something standing behind my mum lately. But my mum was a skeptic and thought his friend was trying to scare her. A few days later, around midnight, mum was about to lock the door in our house when she started to feel like the floor was shaking. Her first thought was that it was an earthquake, but then she saw how our living room tiles started to tear apart and the floor started to crack up in the dark abyss. Dad and her quickly ran outside. As soon as they got there, they started throwing up. My dad didn't puke as much, but my mother puked till blood came out, so my dad kind of knew that something was happening and quickly went inside again and grabbed some holy water that my grandma had brought from Costa Rica not a long time ago. He poured the water into my mum and she immediately stopped puking. He also poured some into himself and scattered it around the house. When they saw how some white smoke came out of the house, then they saw some white smoke leave the house. The next morning, my aunt came and saw the mess. She quickly contacted a shaman or curandero, and they bought lots of stuff for a cleansing ritual. One of my uncles also passed by and told my mum that the spirit was sent with the intention of killing her and that she's lucky to be alive. My dad never saw the floor cracking. The illusion was only seen by my mother. Fast forward a few months and I was born. My half-sister had been telling my mum to never let said family member, Alan, take me anywhere. One morning, Alan came by and asked if he could take me out for a few photos at a restaurant and he'd be back in a few hours. Mum refused, but Dad insisted on letting me go as he was close with Alan and Mum told him what my sister said and he just brushed it off. So I was out all day till 5pm and Mum was mad because he thought we'd be back sooner. That night at 1am, I began crying non-stop. My dad immediately called Alan and asked him what's wrong with me but he told my dad to just go put a glass of water beneath my bed. That worked only the first night. The next night I was crying again, so dad called Alan and this time he said to put a knife under the bed. And again, it only worked once. On the third night, my mum and dad got mad and swinged the knife around, but it also worked that night. They couldn't bear it anymore, so they called for a family friend who's a curandero. She came into our place and inspected my room and said there was something strong in there so she needed to perform a ritual. So they went and brought all the stuff she needed. At the time, Alan used to hang out a lot with a santera, so we suspect she used him to get to us. There was also this one time my dad fought with a friend that practiced voodoo and santeria. Dad was away for a few days and left Mama me alone at home. His friend passed by, gave us a big doll-shaped present and left. It was around dusk and as soon as my mum wrapped the present, I started crying. May have been a coincidence. The doll was an old lady with lots of wrinkles and was quite tall and creepy. Luckily, a cousin had just dropped by, so mum asked him to dispose of the doll and he quickly agreed and left with it. Nothing paranormal happened, but it just became weird and gave somebody a creepy old ass doll for no particular reason. Dad knew an awful lot of friends and family and wasn't on good terms with some of them, so that's why some of them tried to harm us. I'm not a big believer in the paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything firsthand, but I believe in what my mother said, and I'm open to the possibility that everything that happened may have nothing to do with paranormal activity. But I'm interested if anyone has been through anything similar, or knows of hexing or spirits and stuff like that. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. I certainly enjoyed narrating them. What happens is that sometimes I gather material for topics that for me sound really interesting, but then I never really get enough to follow through and um, make a whole video on it, which is why it's a bit of a jumble, this one. Um, I mean, hitchhiking, never really got enough, and I've been waiting a long time to get the rest that one of the stories was about hexing, which I didn't really know how to categorize. 
So yeah, got a nice little mix here. Let me know what you think of these mixed up kind of videos. If you like it, I can probably do a few more of interesting topics that definitely don't get around so often on this channel because of their lack in popularity when I make the finished video. But you know, if this is something that you enjoy, please let me know down below. I would seriously love to know your thoughts. And thank you for making it to the end. You guys mean the world to me. Thank you so much for your support and just watching the videos. Seriously, you're the best. A huge thank you to my members and patrons whose names are on screen. You guys are amazing. Seriously, thank you. Um, again, if anyone wants to join my $10 tier on Patreon, you get stickers and a message from me in the post. So that'd be nice, right? Um, so yeah, just I think, it'd, I think it'd be fun if you want that. And obviously I've got... So much exclusive story on Patreon, uh, content, sorry. I published an 18 minute story that was really fun on there just the other day, well, like the other week actually. Um, it's really good, got exclusive polls that decide videos. I mean, last week's Haunted House video was decided on Patreon. And so every once in a while, there's gonna be more stuff, more stories, more um, personalized content. And if you sign up for the higher tiers, I'm not telling you to do so, but just if you do, you can actually pick a topic that you want and I'll make it into a video within reason. All right, then I'm going to wrap things up here. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully see you again soon. Take care, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one, which might be one of these on screen if you want.